we're working on the seat. So I've got a piece here. Um, this is white pine. What other woods would you use, Curtis? Uh, I mean, anything that's soft. I, I don't like to use, you know, I don't like to carve hardwood seats, although I've been guilty of it. I've carved some walnut <laughs> seats, and that's not too terrible. Uh, and it does, it is awful pretty, but, uh, but still, I, I prefer good uh, softwood seats and high quality eastern white pines, hard to beat. Uh, butternut's great. Uh, Catawpa is good. Uh, basswood is good. Poplar, as long as you get the green heart, you get into that white sapwood and it's, it's pretty, pretty tough. Kiln dried white sapwood, I'd rather carve walnut. Uh, seriously, I'd rather carve the walnut. Uh, been using some yellow buckeye and that's, that just, that has a small range. It's down here in the mountains. Uh, uh, just grows fairly near the, near the creeks. Nobody cuts it for anything. It's no known uses, really. But uh, I found it makes a pretty good seat blank. And then uh, a, a fella who has a little wood miser near me just had a big uh, polonia delivered to him. So he's going to solve oh, that. Really? For seat blanks. Yeah. So I've, I've, I've got the idea to do an invasive species chair. So uh, <laughs> as, polonia, as polonia is an invasive species. So I got the seat blank. Now I got to figure out <clears throat> what to do with the other parts. You know, there's tree of heaven and there's mimosa and, and uh, Bradford pear, all these other God awful things that have gotten into our forest. But, uh, but at any rate, so stay tuned. Maybe I'll do it. Maybe I won't. <laughs> That's great. I love it. Um, so this thing has been drying for two years in my attic or so. Uh, it came from the Biltmore estate in Nashville uh, where they, they do a bunch of, of <laughs> logging on their acreage. Um, so it's, it's reached equilibrium with the shop and not only has it been in my attic, but then I brought it down into the shop for two weeks. So it ac could acclimate with whatever the environment of my shop was, uh, so that it's not neither gaining nor losing moisture content when you start carving it. Uh, cause you can really run into issues with splitting the seat when you drive your wedges of your, uh, leg, leg tenon wedges into the seat you can get big cracks if the outside of the seat has started to dry but the inside hasn't so the thing's under stress um and and you don't want it to to move with you after you've been planing it um anything to add add to that yeah Curtis? Yeah, yeah yeah i mean cupping <clears throat> cupping's a constant issue um you know i mean uh, uh to give you an extreme example at one time, my seat blanks were stored outside in a shed, and they've been out there for years. So they're at the EMC out there, so somewhere between 15 and 18 <clears throat> percent. And then, say in January, it's 10 degrees outside. It's a clear day. I've got a fire roaring in the in the shop, and I'm below 25 uh, <clears throat> percent uh, relative humidity inside the shop. Well, to put that in terms of moisture content. 75% relative humidity is equal to say around 15% moisture content. So that's what my, my, uh, my boards were. Then I bring those boards inside the shop. There's a 10% difference. 25% is 5% moisture content. And I start carving that seat and the seat gains and loses most of its moisture through the end grain. So I'm opening up end grain and that seat's trying to equalize with the environment inside the shop and it will cup really bad with you. <clears throat> so you, yeah, so show them that end grain, especially in the back back there uh, where you're exposing that and uh, it will cup with you uh, quick, real quick. And you've got, you've got issues. There's lots of different ways of dealing with it. If I've, if I've got that problem, I can't get away from it, then I'm gonna put the seat in a plastic bag when I'm not using it, I'm gonna keep it outside. Um, I'm gonna to try to keep a damp towel on top of it as, as I'm carving it. Anything to keep that thing flat uh, because it, it, it'll cause you lots of problems if it, if it, if it cups with you. So, so you wanna watch out for that. So speaking of cup, um, if we look at the seat from the end, you can see it dried with a, quite a bit of cup in it. See how much that thing's rocking on there. Um, and so the first thing we want to do is flatten this seat. 
um, so that we have a flat reference surface to um, measure from when we bore and, and ream our holes. Um, a lot of 18th century chairs, they didn't even bother with this, but certainly most of most modern chair makers pay a lot of attention to flattening our seat first. Um, so I think I would start by removing the, the convex side first. Is that what you would do, Curtis? Yeah, that's what I do. And that's almost always the pith side. <clears throat> you know, on occasion, I've seen it opposite, but it's really rare. You know, yeah. so the pith side is always the convex side. So the growth rings try to straighten themselves out is what happens in that. 